Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today is the start of sort of a challenge test vlog to see how well my patrons know my reading taste. In today's video, I'm gonna be reading books that my patrons think I would be a fan of, books that they've sort of chosen for me, and we'll see how this goes. If you saw my TBR video for the month, you might already know what I'm reading, but May is my birthday month, and what better way to celebrate than to to try to find as many new amazing books that I am really enjoying as possible. So that's the goal of today's video. The goal of this project is to try to find at least a couple of new favorites of the year, to have a really fun time reading books I'm going to enjoy. And I've got to say, I do trust my patrons. They've generally not steered me super wrong. A lot of their recommendations have been fantastic. Books that they've made me read for reading vlogs have been some of my favorites. I've got six books on the TBR for the video. One of them is our book club pick for the month. Four of them are the runners up in our book club poll because for May's book club I asked my patrons to suggest books that they thought I would really love because I knew I wanted to do this video project. So they suggested a ton of things and then we did two rounds of voting. The most voted on option moved on to round two and then the highest ranked of the final five is what got picked for book club. That is Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. I'm very excited about this. A couple of patrons have already started reading it even though it's very early in the month and have been enjoying it. It's a kind of cozy historical fantasy romance from what I understand. I don't want to go in knowing too much but I'm excited for this. That'll be our actual book club pick. Then I'm going to be reading the four other books that made it to the second round of voting but didn't get picked as our book club read. Here are those books. We have Bloodmarked by Tracy Dion. Very excited to pick this one up. It is the sequel to Legendborn, which I really loved. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I was a fan of it. And I've heard people say that if you really liked the first one, you'll probably enjoy the second one. Excited to see how I get on with that. The close runner up to Half a Soul was The Cloud Roads by Martha Wells, which is the first book in a fantasy series from her that I've not read. I'm excited to finally get to this. Somebody commented on my TBR saying this is like polyamorous and all these things. I don't remember what all they said, but what they said sounded amazing. And I know that I love The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells, so I'm very much looking forward to finally reading this. And I should note that this was gifted to me by Beth, who is one of my patrons. So thank you to Beth. I'm finally going to pick this up for the vlog and I'm super excited about it. Then the two other finalists are not books I have physical copies of. These are books that I have audio copies of on Libra FM. The first one is Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism. I'm very excited this made it. I've been meaning to read this for a while and this is the perfect opportunity. I've already started listening to it, so I'll get back to that in a moment. So far I'm enjoying it. It's interesting. And then the other one is Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola. This I believe is a black love contemporary romance set in the UK, like a rom-com, I think. I don't know too much about it, but I've heard good things. And again, I have the audiobook. Lastly, I added on two books that I've been wanting to read for a long time that were gifted to me by patrons. The first one has actually been gifted to me twice by two different people. So I was like, okay, the universe is telling me I need to read this. That is Ashes of the Sun by Django Wexler. This is the first in an epic fantasy series that Brianna from Four Paws in a Book, who is one of the people who gave it, gave it to me, said was pitched to her as queer fantasy Star Wars. I'm down. That sounds great. Yes, thank you. So I'm finally going to read this. It is a tome. I do have the audiobook as well, so I'll probably listen to it. And then lastly, a book I had been wanting to read ever since Ashley, a bookish realm, gushed about it. And then it was gifted to me by the wonderful Christopher. And uh, this was, it was time. And uh, I have actually already finished reading this. I meant to film the introductory clip <laughs> to this vlog before I finished the book, but that didn't happen. That is The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. And I've got to tell you, we have success. This book is freaking amazing and it will be on my list of favorite books of the year. So thank you to Christopher for buying me a copy and getting me to finally pick it up. Y'all, this book had me sobbing while I was super red in the face after exercising. <laughs> Here's a brief clip that I took. You're welcome. 
Oh, I'll put this in after I actually start the vlog, but not this book making me cry at the end of my workout. Oh, God. Ah. <laughs> This book is amazing and it literally had me in tears by the end of it. It follows a young Latina lesbian who is in the closet because she's worried about her homophobic parents kicking her out of the house if she comes out to them. And she is starting at a new school, at a Catholic school, where again she is really afraid of somebody figuring out her sexual identity, but she has a crush on a girl who is out as being gay. And then it turns out that her brother is bisexual and has had a secret boyfriend. So it's a whole thing. I loved this so much. I think it does an incredible job of tackling these really difficult big issues at the intersections of race and religion and sexuality. And even though my experience as somebody who came out to myself as bisexual at 30 and is a former evangelical, had a different path than Yami Letts in this book. I found some elements of what she went through relatable. I, yeah, I loved this. And you know, it's not an easy book. It deals with a lot of intense realities. Content warning for attempted suicide, not by the main character, but by somebody close to her. A lot of homophobia, dealing with racism. I just, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in here. But I think this does a great job of showing why in many parts of the country it is still not safe for everybody to be out when they are teenagers. And sometimes the best, safest thing for young people in certain areas with certain families to do is to stay in the closet until they're adults and able to move out on their own and be safe and secure. So yeah, I think this is a fantastic book. I understand why it was a National Book Award finalist. It made me cry. I loved it. I want to read the next book Sonora Reyes is putting out. So um, thank you, Christopher. I really appreciate it. I loved it. This was such a hit. Um, now I will try to actually update you as I'm, as I'm reading things instead of just like reading the whole book before I even started the video. But A, so far success. One book down, five books to go. I'm very excited. I have also started listening to Cultish and I really like it. It is quite interesting. I have a feeling that if I have a criticism of anything, it's just going to be that it doesn't go into enough depth and that I would want more. I, I suspect that's where I'm going to come out with this. But it is really interesting thinking about the way that organizations, religious organizations, but others as well, use language to create in-groups and out-groups and trying to parse where that's harmful and where it's okay. She uses kind of extreme examples ranging from these suicide death cults, right, which she gets into, versus things like Alcoholics Anonymous, which has its own language and in-group stuff, but it's beneficial, it's not dangerous. So I find it really fascinating. She has a brief place where she mentions some of the language used in evangelical circles, and I was like, yup, mm-hmm. And one thing that I want to think a little bit more about, and I don't know that she's, I don't, we'll see where the book goes. I suspect she may not get into this in a lot of detail, but one of the things that she said is how even once you're out of a group, the way that language exists and trains your brain to think in certain ways continues to linger for a long time. I have certainly found that to be the case, and it it is something I kind of want to sit and think about. It's interesting how language ends up framing the way that you think about stuff and perceive the world and you might not even realize it. So I'm really liking that so far as well. This was a very long introduction because I already finished one of the books, but I will check back in and update you once I've read another one. I finished reading Cultish and I, you know, I fell asleep right after listening to it last night and then didn't sleep real great. So maybe listening to books about cults and religious trauma right before you go to bed is not a good idea. But I did get a lot out of it. I think it's really interesting. I wasn't wrong in my estimation that my only real complaint with it is that I feel like it's too short and doesn't go in depth enough on certain things. I just feel like I end the book wanting more. She's trying to cover so many different 
versions of this. We get kind of this overview survey of different types of cultish entities with a little bit of analysis, but I just wanted more of a deep dive than what this gave me, and it's fine. I think that's not the project of the book, and unfortunately I don't think that's what her next book's about either, too. I wish somebody would really take what has begun here and do some deeper dives into these different subcategories that she gets into because it's really interesting. I think one nuance that she makes, which is important, is the difference between cultish groups that are dangerous and those that aren't. And that some of the ways that we differentiate the two is how high are the stakes? Is it something where you're in a cultish workout thing and then you leave and go home and if you decide that you want to stop going it's not gonna do much to you right versus a high control religious group for instance where that might be very different one thing that is so interesting about this is she talks about how and I maybe I mentioned this before but how language impacts the way that you view the world and sticks with you even after you've left a group. And I think as an ex-evangelical, that's certainly been the case for me. She does talk about some evangelical organizations and even give some specific examples of things from kind of an extreme organization that I was like, oh, oh, I definitely was involved with people affiliated with that at one point in my life. Like, y'all, it's, um, yeah, like the people doing the, like, red tape over their mouths to pray to end abortion in America. Who knew that I would flip so radically and be pro-choice? But, yeah, it's, uh, it is another world, and it is interesting how language and jargon is used to create this in-group and out-group and a sense of connectedness, but also to push you to think about the world in a certain way. I don't know. There, there are a lot of really interesting things about this that I probably need to go process with my therapist the next time I have therapy. <laughs> well, another thing I learned from this that I didn't know is I think most people in vague terms know about the Jonestown cults. It's where the phrase they drank the Kool-Aid came from, even though I guess apparently it wasn't exactly Kool-Aid, it was like store brand version. But this was a cult that ended in mass suicide, sort of. There were some details about the setup of the Jonestown cult that were really interesting to me that I was not aware of. So so Jones was the leader of the cult, this really charismatic white guy who kind of posited himself as a social justice person. He and his wife adopted a bunch of non-white kids and called it their rainbow family. He would go and listen to black preachers and kind of adopt some of their mannerisms for preaching and speaking. And a very large chunk of the Jonestown congregation was black people because he kind of made it out to be this place of escaping from things like police brutality and racism and standing up for what you believe in. And what's interesting about it is you ended up with a congregation that was a lot of black people, especially black women, and it gets into the ways he would use language like comparing uh, a young teen girl to Angela Davis and doing that to like boost her sense of ego and esteem that she could be that important and that was a way of drawing people in, but the people in his inner circle around him, as apparently is often the case, would be these young, pretty white women, while the rest of the congregation was heavily made up of black people. So the racial piece of this was really fascinating, the way he sort of set himself up as an advocate and an ally for racial justice, and then ended up being who he was. I had not heard some of those details before. So there were there were things that it just really got me thinking about how you can really get people who say what they think you want to hear when what they're really interested in is sort of this narcissistic behavior of being in power and being in this position of influence. Um, 
Anyway, it's sad to read, but it's it's pretty fascinating. A phrase that she uses in the book that a lot of these cultish groups implement is something called a thought terminating cliche, which is so fascinating. It's this thing where they will have a cliche that they will implement as a way of not having to keep thinking about difficult things or to get other people to stop talking or thinking about difficult things and avoid criticism oftentimes. And you know what the one in evangelical circles that really bugs me a lot now that I think is exactly what she's talking about, a really good example of a thought terminating cliche is, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. It's pulled from an out of context Bible verse, but the way that I used this <laughs> in my head to push through some of the most difficult times in my life when I was falling apart and probably had depression and anxiety and like so many things but in my head I was like well it's gonna be fine because God will never give me more than I can handle because that's what they always say right I mean no that's actually not true anyway um yeah so like that was the one that popped into my mind when she kept talking about these uh, thought terminating cliches. That's like mine that particularly I found really harmful. Again, I'm gonna need to process a lot of this with my therapist. <laughs> it's like a long thing. Also, did y'all know that there is a, a technical term, a linguistic term for speaking in tongues? It's called glossolalia. And the way she talks about it is so fascinating. She doesn't necessarily think it's a harmful practice, depending on how it's done. Not that it's necessarily what people think it is, but I grew up in, like, speaking in tongues evangelical circles. So, yeah. This, this book, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot, a lot to think about it. I, again, I liked it a lot. I think it's fascinating. I think it does good work. I think it draws you in. It's easy to read. It's conversational. I just wanted more from it. For those reasons, I'm going to give this a four and a half star, but it's very good. I'm not going to go grab it because it's over there and it's late, but I have started reading Blood Marked by Tracy Dion, sequel to Legendborn. So far, I'm liking it. I'm not super far in yet. The one thing I will say about it that I very much appreciate, because it's been a while since I've read Legendborn, is in the first couple chapters, it does a good job of kind of naturally reorienting you to the world and the characters and some of what's happened. Like, oh, right, 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 right. But not in like a over the top, heavy handed way, just enough, at least for me to be like, okay, that's right. That's right. That's where we're at. That's what's going on. Okay, cool. Let's go. Because I don't have time to reread the first one. I will check back in once I've finished another book, but so far, patrons, y'all are good at this. I love it. Hello, today is my birthday and I finally have time to do some vlog clips before I go out and do some other fun things. I have finished two books for this video, um, you know, as one does sometimes, so let's talk about both of them. So first I read Bloodmarked by Tracy Dion and, uh couple things. Number one, I thought this was going to be a duology. That was originally how it was pitched, I think. It's definitely not a duology. Like, we got pretty far into the book and I was like, man, how are they going to wrap this whole thing up so quickly? It's not wrapped up. That's why. <laughs> I mean, like, the plot arc for this book is sort of wrapped up, but it's not a satisfying conclusion for a series finisher. Clearly this was written with the intent of there being more books, but I don't see any more announced on Goodreads, so I don't know what's happening. Um, I've got to say, I liked this, but I did not love it as much as Legendborn. And I don't know if it's that I've heard more people criticize Legendborn since reading it, or that it's just that for whatever reason in this book things stood out to me more. But while I still had a pretty good time with it, one thing that stood out to me was the world building is really chaotic and doesn't always make sense. It's a little all over the place and there's a lot happening and it's not very well explained. And I think for book one, it was fine. We were just getting introduced to it. I could just kind of go with it. And I sort of assumed the author knows what she's doing and it'll sort of come together eventually 
whatever, you know, I think as a fantasy reader, I'm used to jumping into a world where I don't totally get what's going on right away, but eventually it's explained. Having read this book though, I don't feel the same way necessarily. It feels a little bit like throwing lots of things at the wall to see what works. Maybe there, I mean, there is some planning. I, I shouldn't be, I don't want to be so critical. I mean, there are some elements of it that I think were thought through and, and then other things that I'm like, oh, and this is a thing and this is a thing. It feels more like the magic system and the world building and lore serving the story she wants to tell as opposed to being more consistent throughout if that makes sense anyway for uh, for whatever reason that kind of stood out to me more in this book i had heard people complain about this for legend born there i wasn't really bothered by it i was having a good time and kind of along for the ride and was like oh, it's fine it's a first book it'll make sense whereas this one i was like okay <laughs> this is a lot there's a lot happening here. So there was that. The other thing about this is I was not super invested in this whole love triangle thing. I think it worked better for me in book one than I did in book two. There were some things that I just was like, why are we still trusting people? Why are we making the choices we're making? Also, she's so reckless, which I, I don't know. I didn't hate this. I feel like I sound like I'm being very negative, but I didn't hate it. I just, I just was kind of underwhelmed, which is unfortunate. I enjoyed Legendborn more than this, but I think now that we're further into the world and what's going on, I'm like, okay, this is cool, but I want a little bit more from it. One of the things I do like about this book and the series in general is that it's exploring some of these difficult questions of bloodline and how sexual assault of enslaved black women ends up leading to people with certain bloodlines. Part of what this is exploring here is the realities of what some white people's ancestors have done and the ramifications of that going forward. I think there are some really important big topics covered in here. It deals pretty effectively with that and with the racism and misogyny that she faces as somebody who's supposed to be the heir to this whole Arthurian secret society. I'm not going to give too many details because I don't want to spoil things, but thematically I think there's some things that are interesting. Oh, there was one choice toward the end that I was like, huh, that's an interesting choice. I don't know how I feel about it, but I don't know that how I feel really matters. I would just say I suspect that other readers might have mixed feelings about this choice. I kind of get what the author was going for, but also, I, I don't know, I could see people criticizing it. There ends up being, again, not to get too specific with spoilers or anything, there ends up being sort of like a secret base, we'll say, for workers of root magic, so black magic users where they have cleansed and taken over a former plantation and now white people aren't allowed in the main house and I don't know I it was weird it was a little weird I not not because they weren't letting white people in the main house that wasn't the part that was weird it was the the choice of having your base be this place where there was so much pain caused to your ancestors when your magic is rooted in working with their spirits. I don't know. It just struck me as kind of weird. I kind of get it. I kind of get what the author was going for, but the idea might have been sort of reclaiming something and uh, turning something that had been harmful into something supportive. I get that. I I feel like it was a weird choice. Again, my opinion on that choice specifically is not really the one that matters, but I but I wouldn't be shocked to see some own voices reviewers questioning that decision. I don't know. It was it was interesting. And also Okay, I can't say this because it's going to spoil the ending, but there was a thing about her decision at the end that also struck me as weird. Um yeah. If you've read this and you know the decision that she makes, the <sighs> I don't know. There were there were some weird choices made in this book. 
parts of it were fun and action-packed. It was very twisty. There were some interesting things that happened, but overall definitely not a favorite for me. What would I rate this? I don't know. As I was reading it, I was thinking like three or three and a half stars, but now that I'm talking about it in depth, is it a two and a half? I don't know. It's somewhere in there. It's a two and a half or three. Sorry. I'm sorry. I know y'all wanted me to read this and some of you probably thought I would love it, especially because I did really love the first book. Maybe I'm being overly critical of this. There were things that I liked about it. And overall, I had a pretty good time with it. I think there's some interesting things happening. And I like the fact that it is centering a black girl and her lived in experience in this magical world that I think is really cool. And giving her autonomy and power and having her learn lessons. So like, there are things that are great about this. But then there are some other things that I was like, huh, Okay, not like a three. It's a three star. It's going to be a three star. I, I don't, I feel like there's enough good to outweigh the negatives for me. It's going to be a three star read for me. I've just decided. Unfortunately, though, this was probably the biggest miss we've had so far with this video. But I do understand why people might have thought I would love it because I loved the first one. I do think looking at other reviews of this, a lot of the people who did love this are people who really enjoyed the first book, and a lot of the people who had problems with this also had problems with the first book. This makes me nervous to reread Legendborn because I wonder if now I would see more issues with it. I don't know. I really loved it when I first read it. Okay, three stars. It's, it is, it is what it is. Um, but then I read Cloud Roads, and this was so good. Like, really interesting, unique fantasy world. How do you even talk about this? It took me a little bit to get into it because I was like, what is like, what's going on? But man, it's really incredible. Interesting world building, great characters, surprising twists and turns and a plot that goes in directions that I wouldn't have foreseen. I want to read more in the series. It's the first book in the series. And the main character is this guy named Moon, who was orphaned as a kid, secretly a shifter, but has to hide that from humans that he lives with or groundlings is what he calls them because they're going to think that he's fell, which are these kind of like evil, demonic, creepy things that also are shifters. But he's not, he knows he's not that, but he doesn't know what he is. And then he, through a series of unfortunate events, things happen, and he ends up finding out that he is what's called a Roxura, and ends up being introduced to his people. And there's a lot of things happening, plots and politics and danger and interweaving things. It's interesting too because it's a queer norm society, it's polyamorous, and there's some drama surrounding that. I wouldn't call this a romance or anything, but it has kind of casual polyamory if that's something you're looking for. But what's interesting about it is that biologically the Raxura are a little bit like bees. I mean they're people and they're sentient and shapeshifters, but in the sense that usually there's one queen for a colony who is fertile and able to give birth to clutches of babies and then everybody else is infertile but there are some males like moon who are consorts who are able to procreate with a queen and then there are other people that are sort of like worker bees kind of like people who are warriors or people who are caretakers and they have these like biological imperatives to things that they do but then with a magical element overlaid on top of it and personhood and sentience. It's really fascinating. And the way that she kind of unpacks the culture and history of these people, it's it's very cool. And the characters are great. I ended up loving this. It's very good and very creative and different from other things that I've read. So I for sure would want to read on in the series. I think this was a fantastic choice. What would I rate this? I, this might be a five star read. It's right in that like four and a half, five star range really great pick. I don't know that I would put it on favorite books of the year per se, but I did really love it. I think it's excellently crafted. And depending on how the rest of the series goes, this is the kind of thing where I could see the series being a favorite if it continues this way, even if this particular book wasn't a new favorite. So yeah, I'm so glad I finally read this. Martha Wells is amazing. Her brain. I love it. 
Next up, I am only a chapter in so far, but I am reading Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola, and so far it's very entertaining, it's super snarky, and I think it's gonna be quite fun. It's a contemporary romance set in the UK, and it follows a college-age young woman who is just getting out of an uncomfortable situationship that she probably shouldn't have gotten herself into in the first place. And the humor is just really entertaining and working for me. So I will continue reading that and I'll check back in once I finish. But overall I'm having a really good time with this project and it's helping me get to stuff that I've been wanting to read for a long time. Hi! Um, so I did finish another book and I want to talk about it. Filming this feels a little weird. It's the first time I filmed anything since we got news that um, one of my in-laws unexpectedly passed away. And um, that's hard. And um, we're gonna be traveling for the funeral and managing grief with our kids. I don't know that it's something I want to talk a lot about, at least at this point, um, but if I seem subdued, <laughs> that's why. Uh, main reason I want to kind of explain that we had an unexpected um, death of somebody close to us. So that said, I did read Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola and I liked it. It is very fresh and snarky new adult kind of college age romance between two people who are sort of enemy. I don't know that I would even call them enemies, but it starts with fake dating and they end up getting together. I don't know. I liked it. I will say I feel old <laughs> reading it. It's like, it's one of those books where I read this and I'm like, man, I'm just, I feel like I'm a little bit too old to fully appreciate this. And that's no shade to the book. I think it's very good. And I think especially younger readers who are closer to college age will probably enjoy it even more than I did. Uh, there were a lot of things that I liked about it. It tackled some really big issues dealing with racism and colorism in the UK and in the university. And I liked the relationship between the main characters. I liked the way that it tackled issues of consent. And I liked the kind of snarky banter dynamic between the two characters. Also, I can totally see see why patrons would have suggested this book for me specifically. As a fan of prickly heroines in romance, you definitely get that in this. It's two very smart characters who both kind of give as good as they get to a certain extent, and so that I do think is a fun dynamic. Yeah, there was a lot to like about this. I don't know what I would rate it. It's probably between a four and a four and a half star for me. The main thing that drops it down is just, I think, my personal enjoyment wasn't up to a five star level, but again, I really just think it's because of my age. This feels very young, very fresh, and very grounded in current university politics and pop culture and sort of what it's like at the moment to be that age. I don't know the age of the author. I'm guessing she's probably on the younger side. Um, but yeah, I thought this was very good. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. I think a four star. It's like a four star for me. I had a good time. This was not a bad pick. I can see why patrons chose it for me. I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, I, ha I had fun with it. It was good. So I am not far into it yet, but I am next reading Ashes of the Sun by Django Wexler. And I see where people are getting the fantasy Star Wars because there are siblings that are separated for reasons in childhood. And yeah, I'm very curious to see where it's going to go. There's some interesting things so far. So I will check back in once I have finished the next book. But so far, this has been a very positive experience for me. And uh, yeah, hopefully... Hopefully reading some good books will bring some joy in the midst of everything that's been going on. So, yeah. Okay.
Hello, I finished reading Ashes of the Sun by Jango Wexler and I wanted to talk about it. So this was really interesting. I liked it. I don't think I love it in the way that some people do, but I did like it quite a bit. There were a lot of things I enjoyed about it and I've liked what I've read from Jango Wexler. I've got to say he's one of the guys who writes pretty good female characters, including women in sapphic relationships. There's two main perspective characters in this book, a brother and a sister who were separated in childhood for reasons and the sister is queer and has a love interest and I thought that that was really compelling and really well written and actually one of the things about this book that I think made me love it less was that I was so much more invested in her perspective than in her brother's perspective. I just thought it was more interesting and compelling and I was more invested in the characters in that sort of half of the book whereas her brother's I was like yeah okay it's whatever it's fine like sometimes it was interesting and sometimes I was just less concerned with what was going on with him but I did really like this I can see why it's been compared to Star Wars and in fact I found a thing saying that Django Wexler openly credits Star Wars with some of the inspiration for this and I do think it does some interesting things if you're a Star Wars fan you can see some of the seeds of taking some of the ideas of what happened there and then rolling out these what ifs. It's set in a fantasy world that also has technology so it's kind of like a sci fantasy blend which is pretty interesting and the sister was taken at five years old by the order to be trained to become one of their sort of enforcers. Very similar to how the Jedi would take kids who were very young who showed great abilities in the force from their families, but I think what's interesting about this is that it's exploring this idea of what if they don't want to go with the Jedi and are forced to and the sibling left behind, in this case her brother, is angry and ends up joining people trying to rebel against the order that they have even if it's gonna harm humanity and ends up leading to grown-up brother and sister who are on opposite sides, right? And that's kind of what you get here. It's really interesting. So it's playing with these questions of morality and governance and like how there can be problems even with governments that have good intentions and there can be negative fallout. Yeah, I really like it. It's a smart book. It's doing some interesting things, exploring things that I don't think we see explored in this way in the Star Wars universe, but using some similar plot points to things that happen there and well what would be the consequence of something like this going on right i will say it's pretty action heavy which is not my preferred brand of fantasy but it's not so much that i didn't enjoy myself but it, it's definitely focused more on the plot and the action than on the characters and world building although we're getting character development and world building like you do get it it's good it's just this isn't a deep character study theme focused book it has those things in it for sure, but it does lean a little heavier onto the action than what some of my favorites do. So all in all, this would probably be about a four star read for me, but that's not a bad thing. It means I liked it. I had a good time with it. It is really long. And would I continue with the series? Maybe, maybe. They are really long books. I don't feel immediately compelled to pick up the next book. I am fairly satisfied with what I got out of this book. So probably if I were going to continue on with the series, it would be because I had a reason to do it. Somebody was doing a read along and I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, but I did like this and I would seek out other things from Django Wexler because this is the second time I've read a book from him that I've quite enjoyed. I'm curious about his YA. I know he has a YA series, so maybe I'll check that out at some point. But yeah, this was a win. Even if it's not a new favorite, I liked it. I finally read it. I had, a, it was quite a tome that had been sitting on my shelves and I needed to get to it and so I'm glad that uh, this did it. The final book for this project that I'm reading is Half a Soul. I have started it. I'm not far into it yet but I am liking it so far and we are about to travel to be with family and so I'll probably read it while I'm there and at some point do a final vlog clip for this and then kind of round up how things went. Overall, I'm having a good time with the project though. I think it's going pretty well. One thing I will say about Half a Soul is I don't know if this is intentional on the part of the author, but it kind of reads like 
it's about being neurodiverse because yeah I mean like technically the reason for it in the book is there's a fae that takes half her soul and so she doesn't feel things as intensely or in the same ways as other people but in her perspective as an adult it's really that she has struggles with social cues and doesn't react the way people expect her to and I don't know like a lot of it feels very relatable for being neurodiverse and so I'm curious whether that's the intention of the author that said I'm enjoying it it's fun it's whimsical I like the main character it took me a little bit to get into the writing the first like the prologue and the beginning of the first chapter it's got like a particular flavor to the style of of writing but I'm I'm liking it so I will check back in once I have finished half a soul we'll see how this goes hello I am back doing much better thank you so much to everybody for your kind words and support I know I had a video go up during this time where I mentioned I was taking a break because of loss um and I'm really glad I just took that time off I didn't worry about making videos to post while I was gone I just took time with my family and I think that was really good and really healing and needed and thankfully I wasn't sure how I would feel coming back but um I'm feeling really excited and ready to hit the ground running and do things and I did read Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. I did not read very much <laughs> during my week off, but I did read a couple of things and this was one of them. I finished the, the second half of this on the airplane back home actually. Half a Soul is also the, is the one that won the poll for book club, so I'm really interested to discuss it with everybody. I enjoyed it a lot. I have some questions about it. I wish I could pick the brain of the author to be honest because I have some questions about what her intent was with the main character. So this is a Regency fantasy romance with Fae. It's set in kind of Regency England with all of the etiquette and manners that you would expect from that. But layered on top is magic and the existence of Fae. And it follows a young woman who as a young girl, a fey lord stole half her soul before he was stopped, before he could take the whole thing. And so because of that, the way that she interacts with the world and experiences things is different from other people. She has feelings, but they're deeper and less acute and kind of build up more over time. She struggles with social interactions, reacting in the way that people expect her to. She's kind of quirky and a little bit different. And honestly, I'm reading this and reading this character and I'm like, this feels like a book about a character who is neurodivergent. You know, and as somebody who is neurospicy myself, there were things about her experience of the world that I related to, not everything, but like some things. And I kept thinking, this really reads to me like a character. And it's, you know, it's pr the premise is that she's lost half her soul, right? And lost the more passionate, emotional side of things or something, which like you could question that. But I did really like this as a depiction of what it can be like to be in the head of somebody who is neurodiverse. And I'm not sure that that was the intent of the author. That's what I'm curious to find out is, was this intended to be a, you know, kind of magical representation of a, a different sort of brain mechanics that struggles with certain things but still feels things deeply and has personhood and loves and cares for people and does valuable things in the world because that I really like. I had an experience towards the end of this that was a little bit of a mixed bag. A lot of the book is because her cousin, who is her best friend, wants her to be cured and she's pushing her to meet the Lord Sorcerer. He's like the sorcerer for the king and he's this very kind of grumpy snarky guy and of course there ends up being a romance between the two of them which I loved. I loved the two of them. Like it was a really sweet, soft, slow, courtly romance. It's not spicy at all but just all the feelings and I loved that and I loved how he loved her as she was and understood her and got her. That was so beautiful. The thing that I was concerned about was okay is this going to be something where she gets some magical cure and we got most of the way to the end and that didn't end up happening. I won't spoil why but I was like oh I love it. I love that that this is celebrating her as she is and not giving her a magical cure. And then in like the last couple sentences of the book, it alludes to the fact that maybe in the future at some point she she was cured and we don't know. It's like something people say. So maybe that's not even the case. I hope it's not because that would kind of it would kind of ruin it for me. 
to be honest, not ruin it entirely, but it would definitely put a damper on it. I love the idea that she is celebrated as she is and that she doesn't need these other things to be like normal or something. I think that's really beautiful and I really loved their relationship and I loved her as a character and um, this was just like cozy and lovely and once I got into the writing style I was really a fan of it. So that's where my question is, is I'm like what was the author's intent <laughs> and why did we put that line at the end of the book that suggests that maybe maybe she's cured. I'm like, dude, why? Come on. Come on. <laughs> like, uh, that's so frustrating. But I did really enjoy this a lot. It was great. And I think this was a fantastic pick. Favorite of the year? No. I, listen, this was going to be a five star. And then there was that line at the end. And now, I don't know, maybe it's a four and a half. I think it's a four and a half because it didn't totally go, you know, balls to the wall with just being like, let's celebrate neurodivergence. But I really enjoyed it a lot. It was a lovely book. It's very cozy. It's, you know, like if you enjoy Austin-esque romances that also have social commentary, this is giving you all of that. There's a lot to love here. And I would read more from this author for sure. There's a little novella at the end that is the backstory to the Lord Sorcerer, the love interest. I did not care for that. It was kind of boring and I felt unnecessary. But if you were somebody who likes a lot of extra content from different character perspectives, maybe you would enjoy it. I could have skipped it and been totally fine. So yeah, four and a half star read. I would call this a success. So here are the four physical books that I have that I read. I also had these two books that I had as audiobooks and I guess the question is how did my patrons do suggesting books they thought I would love? I think they did a pretty good job. Now granted, we only had one book that actually made a favorites of the year list, but I also think that's hard to do. It's hard to know what's going to be somebody's favorite. Far and away, Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. Oh my god, it's so good. If something can make me cry like this, it's, it's an easy favorite. It was really excellent. I would say that's pretty closely followed by The Cloud Roads and then Half a Soul. Loved both of these. I think these were both also fantastic picks. And I think people who understand my taste and the kinds of things I would enjoy in fantasy and in fantasy romance, not that these are at all similar to each other, but both of them have things in them that I do love. And I think my patrons did a great job picking both of those for me. Those were great picks too. I feel similarly about Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola. It's another one where, yes, it didn't fully hit for me, I think because of my age, but I really enjoyed it and I think it was a good pick. I understand why patrons picked it for me. It's got a prickly heroine. It's got this great banter dynamic between the characters. It's got social commentary underlying it. This was an excellent pick and I can totally see why they would think it could be a favorite for me. So even though it wasn't a new favorite, I still really loved it. And then even the two that were in the four star range, I still had a really good time with. So Ashes of the Sun by Django Wexler and Cultish, not books that I loved as much. I think cultish, I wanted it to dig a little bit deeper and be expanded. This one I think was more a personal preference thing. I was just much more engaged in one of the perspectives than the other and it leaned a little heavier into the action than what I would have preferred for a book of this length, but still really enjoyed them. I can see why they were recommended to me. They for sure hit things that I generally enjoy. I liked the books. I'm glad I read them. The only real miss <laughs> of this and I think it can be kind of excused was Bloodmarked. I wanted to love this so much more than I did but there ended up just being too many things that I was like oh, okay. I mean you saw my review in this video. This was the only the only book on this list that was really kind of a miss for me. Otherwise I think that's a really good hit rate. We got one new favorite of the year and all but one of these six books were at least four stars. So how well do my patrons know me? pretty well, honestly. And I think even Bloodmarked, it was a good bet that I would enjoy it given how much I liked Legendborn. While some difficult things did happen through the course of making this video, overall I had a really good experience with it. I had fun. I read some books that I loved and this made for a really good TBR. So thank you so much to all of my wonderful supportive patrons and all of my other viewers who often recommend good books to me and get a feel for what my tastes are. I, I think my patrons know me pretty well. 
I've got to say, and I'm, I'm very pleased with the outcome of this. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, okay, we have two questions. Number one, do you have someone in your life who knows your taste really well? Do you have somebody that you're like, I trust you to recommend good books to me that like, you know what will work for me specifically? Because I think that's a cool thing to have. And secondly, I'm considering maybe doing this again with viewer recommendations. So if you have a book that you think I would really love that you're like, Bethany, you would love this book. I think I asked this on another video too. I'll have to go back and look, but this video is easier for me to find it. So if you have a book that you're like, Bethany, you're gonna love this. This is so up your alley. Leave it in the comments down below and maybe I will pick it for a future video. We'll see. If you guys like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.